Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, episode 299. Greta, hey. Magavanen. Magavanen? <laughs> Magavanen. It's uh, Elvish for uh, well met. Oh, yes. I like that. Yeah, like you never that. heard that. You never heard that one before. I wasn't sure if you I, had. So I probably have, but I threw that one in there. You know, that's clever. I like it. Yeah. Well, well met to you, John. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm-hmm. In this episode, we will be discussing Chapter Twenty of the Silmarillion of the Fifth Battle near Nyeth Arnoidiad. 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 I'm, it's like I'm a annoyed fanc- by how hard that is to say. I was just going to say, it's like a <clears throat> fancy way of saying annoyed. No, it's uh, the unnumbered tears. Unnumbered tears. Yeah. Nyeth Arnoidiad. I, Arnoidiad. I, get, I annoy myself every time I shorten that. <laughs> All right. Um, before we get started, we'd like to give a double up air five to our patrons. Three, two, wait. Get them up there. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Whoopsht. Nice. Nice. Special thanks to this episode's executive producers, John R., Caitlin of T with Tolkien, Jacob Lockham, John H., and Scotchy Bobo. Thanks, guys. Shout out to our newest patron, Seb M., who made an oh, annual donation. Nice. Thank you so much, Seb. Yes, thank you. Really appreciate it. And a uh, shout out to uh, our patron, Matthew W., who boosted his pledge. So thank you, Matthew. Nice. Really yeah, appreciate that. that is awesome. Become a patron by visiting patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Doing so gets you cool perks like 20% off of everything at truemisspress.com. Plus your financial support helps the Tolkien Road to keep on evering on. Learn more at patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Don't forget to go over there and check out your Two Trees camper mug. Uh, You get 15% off for the month of July when you use the code STRIDER. So you get an even better discount if you're a patron. So just remember that. All right, and uh, hey, YouTube, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and let us know what's on your mind in the comments below. Um, yeah, so make sure to pay attention to all the stuff we got in the show notes and all that good stuff. Let's dive in. Let's do it. Our quote of the week comes from this chapter, and it's a good one. It's a good one. Then Huor spoke and said, Yet if Gondolin stands but a little while, then out of your house shall come the hope of elves and men. This I say to you, Lord, with the eyes of death, though we part here forever, and I shall not look on your white walls again, from you and from me a new star shall arise. Mm, Yes. Prophetic words. Indeed. Prophetic Mm. indeed. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Sad, but with a ray of hope. Yeah, I feel like this quote is good. It just uh, kind of sets the stage, I feel Mm -hmm. like, for the rest of the, the, for the last four chapters. Yes. You know, so you'll see what we mean. If you haven't already read, if you already know, but if this is your first time reading, then you'll see what we mean. All right, let's dive into chapter 20. Chapter 20 tells of the fifth great battle of Beleriand, the most fateful and cataclysmic yet, near Nyeth Arnoidiad, the battle of unnumbered tears. You should read this. Uh, sorry, that was from last week. We fixed this disclaimer. As of each episode, we won't. Well, I mean, you should read it anyway beforehand if you can, right? And then listen to our discussion, you know, but you do you. You do however, however you want to. As with each episode, we won't be covering every detail of this chapter, but instead doing our best to hit the high points and unpack interesting and important details. If we miss something you guys want to discuss more, let us know. Uh, timeline. <clears throat> so, this happens immediately after the events of Baron and Luthien, uh, the last chapter we read, and it takes place during the years 469 to 472 of the Year of the Sun, Years of the Sun. Um, and it begins with an epilogue which is kind of strange because you think an epilogue is normally the end of something. Yes, I found, I found that odd as well. But the prologue of this chapter is, in fact, an epilogue. Yeah. So yeah. about Baron and Luthien, of all people. What's what's happening with those crazy kids? Yeah, I'm curious. Well, let's read about it. Yes. All right, Greta, do you want to read this? I'm going to let you here? do it. You want me to do this one? Yeah, okay. I think so. There's some hard-looking words in there. All right. Yeah. It is said that Baron and Luthien returned to the northern lands of Middle-earth and dwelt together for a time as living man and woman, and they took up again their mortal form in Doriath. Those that saw them were both glad and fearful, and Luthien went to Menegroth and healed the winter of Thingol with the touch of her hand. But Melion looked in her eyes and read the doom that was written there, and turned away. For she knew that a parting beyond the end of the world had come between them, and no grief of loss has been heavier than the grief of Melion the Maya in that hour. Then Baron and Luthien went forth alone, fearing together thirst, neither thirst nor hunger, and they passed beyond the river Galeon into Osiriand, 
and dwelt there in Tolgalen the Green Isle, in the midst of Adurant, until all tidings of them ceased. The Eldar afterwards called that country Dorfirn Iguinar, the land of the dead that live. And there was born Dior Aranel, the beautiful, who is after known as Dior Elukhil, which is Thingol's heir. No mortal man spoke ever again with Baron, son of Barahir, and none saw Baron or Luthien leave the world or marked where at last their bodies lay. So, um, you know, it's nice to get a word about uh, kind of their fate and understand what uh, what happened, you know, to them as they came back. Mm -hmm. um, let's take a look at the at the map here so we can understand where they are. Um, so uh, we're kind of covering up the spot, actually. Let's see if I can zoom in. All right, so here's here's our map. Uh, can I move us over here? There you go. Move us. Woo! All right, moving over. All right. So they are. They go over here to uh, Assyriand, right? And let's see if I can zoom in to the spot. So down here in this lower right-hand corner, Tolgalen, right? So like Doriath's up here. Mm. Um, no, I don't want to zoom in. There we go. All right. Uh, Angband's up here. You know, all the action of Baron and Luthien took place kind of in this in this general area right uh, that kind of bounds the area right there and they way down here so it's really really off the beaten path yeah. right really off the beaten path where they go to live uh, but we do know that they uh that they have this this son dior and um he he will play uh a little bit of a role so baron and luthien really we don't you know there's really not much more said about them uh but dior uh is actually uh you know somewhat of an important figure not not a hugely important figure but uh but definitely has his his important pivotal role to play uh in the story so and he's their only child is as far as i know yeah. yeah yeah i don't believe i think he's the only one that tolkien ever mentions so okay. yeah um so you know we, we hear that it, it is nice that they get to come back and uh, at least like melian gets to say goodbye to her parents and mm -hmm. you know um but i don't know that it makes i'm sorry luthien gets to say goodbye to her parents i don't know that it makes melian really feel yeah. much better uh but she does heal the winter of thingle um mm -hmm. Which, after you after we read the rest of, of Thingol, what happens with Thingol, I'm not sure if that's necessarily such a good thing. But, uh, hey, you know, what she's supposed to do, it's her dad, right? You know, she needs to make him feel better. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right. Um, yeah, any, any more thoughts on that uh, on that prologue that is an epilogue? No, I don't, I don't think so. It's, it's kind of, um, you know, it's, it seems a little uh, not quite anticlimactic, but it's like there was... You know, I think I think maybe they peaked early with all the excitement in their lives, and then they just you know yeah chilled. I yeah, think that's cool. You're like, well, let's yeah. just take it easy from here on out. Yeah, I think that's I think they earned it. That's right. Yeah. I do too. All right. Well, let's talk about really what this chapter is. Uh, you know, is is in focus in this chapter, and that is this plot of Methros, right? This the eldest son of Feanor. Uh, Methros. Uh, he decides that it's time to take the battle to Morgoth, right? It's time to really take the battle to him. It says, <clears throat> He lifted up his heart, perceiving that Morgoth was not unassailable, for the deeds of Baron and Luthien were sung in many songs throughout Beleriand. Yet Morgoth would destroy them all, one by one, if they could not again unite, and make new league and common council. And he began those councils for the raising of the fortunes of the Eldar that are called the Union of Methros. <clears throat> Yeah, so he decides, you know, on this thing, the Union of Methros, he's basically trying to get, going to try to get as many of the foes of Morgoth and Beleriand together to do, you know, to do battle against um, Morgoth. And they're not just going to kind of go in one large group, but he's got a plan. He mm -hmm. devises this plan for how he's going to, you know, kind of put, as it says, put Morgoth uh, between the hammer, the, the the forces of Morgoth between the hammer and the anvil, right? Um, so... You know, this is this is how things start off in this chapter. Um, they they manage to get just about everybody together, including dwarves and and most of the men that reside in Beleriand, except for Doriath. Thingol does not want anything to do with them, and uh, Nargathron. So Oradreth, um, you know, who was the brother of, uh, well, that's actually confusing which, what he actually is, but he's one of the he's one of the sons. He's one of the brothers of uh, Finrod, right? And so he's not real keen on coming because he's like, I don't really like those uh, sons, those uh, sons of Fanor anymore, right? Uh, because 
I don't really want to help them because they were pretty awful, right, yeah. to the people that matter to me. So um, so he does not come, but but some people from, Nor- from Nargothrond do come, and that's an imp- uh, important thing to note. Uh, so Orodreth won't lead, kind of lead the official army of, of, of Nargothron, but some do choose to go, um, especially some men choose to go. Um, so, uh, and it's it's worth noting that uh, part of the reason Thingol won't go is because the sons of Fanor are like, you better give us that Silmaril you got, right? We got our oath going. You better give us that, that Silmaril. And he's like, hmm, nope, I like this thing. I like this thing too much. It's interesting to read about... Um, you know, you know about what he, how how he reacted to the Silmaril. Um, do you want to maybe uh, read this just a little bit right here? <clears throat> For Methros and his brothers, being constrained by their oath, had before sent to Thingol and reminded him with haughty words of their claim, summoning him to yield the Silmaril or become their enemy. Melion counseled him to surrender it. <clears throat> But the words of the son of Feanor were proud and threatening, and Thingol was filled with anger, thinking of the anguish of Luthien and the blood of Baron, whereby the jewel had been won, despite the malice of Kelegorm and Curifin. And every day that he looked upon the Silmaril, the more he desired to keep it forever, for such was its power. Sounds like it's kind of becoming his precious. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, so Melion tells him, just get rid of it. You don't need it anymore, mm-hmm. right? And what does he do? Once again, <laughs> ignores her counsel. I mean, you married a goddess, my man. Like you I gotta, know. like you think you'd listen, you listen to her. I mean, she's she's kept your kingdom safe with her girdle, right? Mm-hmm. You know, her magical girdle for all of these years, and you're just like, eh, I think I'm gonna hang on to it. <laughs> Idiot. All right. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I will say it's. Um, it seems to be also like he has maybe this emotional attachment to it, right? Because he's he's thinking about like now his daughter's gone forever, right? Yeah. As is his son-in-law, and this. I mean, I'm not saying that his motives were pure. I think they were far from it. But I can I can sympathize with him a little bit, being that this be like you know just thinking about the sacrifice that those people that he cared so dearly about have made to get it to him. Yeah. Um. But I still think he he should have listened to Melian. Well, undoubtedly, yeah, undoubtedly he should have listened to her. I mean, I think, you know, he, you know, you can find it. He can find excuses. And it's like, you know, the last person I want to give this to is the son, the sons of Fanor, right? Especially when they're coming at me like they're hot stuff, right? You know, I'm the king, you know, because he's still, you know, he's like, I'm the king, right? I'm the rightful king of Beleriand. You guys are all here just because I'm letting you be here, right? And, but, you know, I mean, it's, I don't think this, there's a whole lot to say that, you know, like to sympathize with Thingol on this. It's just kind of like, he's just being, he's being greedy and, Mm -hmm. and dumb. And he should have listened to Melion, right? Mm -hmm. Like when she's telling him, get rid of this thing, it would have been smart to do that. Yeah, it would have been, you know, it would have been. So, yeah. And he's, he's going to learn that the hard way, unfortunately. All right. Um, so the plan is that they're going to basically assault Angban from east and west, and they're going to have a large army kind of uh, kind of comes up and draws out the army of the, of Morgoth's armies, so like kind of draw out his force, and then as once they're drawn out, the plan is for let me pull up our map here. The plan is for Fingon to lead the forces, his forces of uh, that live in Hithlum over here. They're kind of they're kind of hidden, waiting, and then and then once the armies of Morgoth are drawn out, to kind of like come over on their flank, right, and uh, and then put them. That's between the hammer and the anvil, right? Like kind of crush them between this big force on one side and Fingon's force on the other side. So that's that's the plot. That's the plan. Uh, the uh, it sounds like nothing could possibly go wrong. Nothing could possibly go wrong with that. Never. Right? Yeah. No. This is, the this best laid plan. plans. Genius. Absolutely. Genius. Um, I, I, and I, and I, I'm being a little silly, but I don't, I don't speak to the, uh, you know, I think there's some really good videos out there on like, you know, that kind of assess the, uh, like do more of a tactical assessment of the different battles and Tolkien stories. Oh. Um, huh. so, you know, those are, uh, 
go check, you know, go find those, check those out to get more of a thorough analysis on, uh, on how this all works. But that's the, that's the simple idea. That's a simple version of what the plan is here. So on the day of battle, you might be wondering, well, what about Gondolin? Any chance Gondolin's going to, going to help with this? And they surprise everybody by showing up. They surprise everybody by showing up. So, so were they not, they weren't asked initially. Uh, by Mathros, or were they? Well, no. They, I think I think they were. I think they were. Okay, um, and they said no. Well, I don't know that they said anything, right? Because they're oh. Gondolin, right? Oh, they're secret. Doriath and Nargothrond both said no, but Gondolin oh. is secret, you know. So I'm not yeah. sure what they. I'm not sure if they said they were coming or not. Okay. Um, but here it says you want to read. Um, well, here I'll, this one has some hard words in it, so I'll read it for you. Okay. <clears throat> Let me get a little water. Okay. One of these days, I'll get the hard words mastered. It's all good. But now a cry went up, passing up the wind from the south from vale to vale, and elves and men lifted their voices in wonder and joy. For unsummoned and unlooked for, Turgon had opened the leaguer of Gondolin, and was come with an army ten thousand strong, with bright mail and long swords and spears like a forest. Then, when Fingon heard afar the great trumpet of Turgon his brother, the shadow passed and his heart was uplifted, and he shouted aloud, Utulien and Naure, Ayel Dalie, Ara Tanatari, Utulian Are. The day has come. Behold, people of the Eldar and fathers of men, the day has come. And all those who heard his great voice echo in the hills answered, crying, Alta Ilome, the night is passing. So, you know, I, this is one of those scenes that I'd love to see. You know, it it kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, you know the when when the Rohirrim show up. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it has that kind of feel to it of just like, and I don't think the the bat like the the thickest part of the battle isn't yet underway when this happens, but it's still kind of like you know, that you know, no one. I don't think anybody really thought Gondolin was going to show up. They weren't sure, but you know, no one. Why would they? Right? They're they're nestled away in their little place right there. And here they show up, and it's like, oh, we're gonna win. Like, we're definitely gonna win now, right? We've got, you know, we got Torgon showing up to the party, right? Mm-hmm. So this is, you know, it, you can understand how they, everybody would just be so encouraged by this, right? Like, this is the day. This is the day we beat Morgoth, right? That we that we finally put an end to Morgoth's reign. And man, it's just that's why this is this tra- this this chapter is just so is so tough. That's why it's unnumbered tears because they their hearts are lifted up so high at this point with with Turgon showing up and then what unfolds that makes it even worse, right? It's yep. it's kind of like you're lifted up really high and then the mm-hmm. crash is even worse, right? Right. right. Yep. Um yep. It's like you have that little bit of hope, you know, mm-hmm. and then it's just poof, snuffed out. Yeah. Yeah. So Morgoth, you know, I mean, Morgoth's smart. Morgoth's a pretty smart guy. Uh, and he he kind of, you know, he's got spies everywhere. He's always, like, suspicious. You know, it's like, um, uh, what's the saying? Anyway, they're, they're, you know, just pick your favorite saying about, like, you know, don't uh, don't try to, you know, don't try to fool a liar, right? Or don't try to, you know, don't try well, to lie to a liar. Kidder, son. Right. Um, you know, uh, like... It, Morgoth, you just can't you can't pull that on him. So this whole thing about like the forces of Fingon kind of waiting, you know, waiting at the ready, you know, Morgoth is kind of up on that, and so he sends he sends his own force over in that direction to kind of try to draw them out, and they won't come. They're they're being disciplined, right? They're they're being they're being disciplined not to not to come. And um, and so what they what Morgoth does is he sends he sends this you know uh ask for parlay, right? So we're going to go and we're going to talk, you know, and what do they do? Well, they show up with a prisoner and a really awful scene unfolds. So Greta, do you want to read this yes, passage? Sure. Then the captain of Morgoth sent out riders with tokens of parlay and they rode up before the outworks of the Barad Ethel. With them, they brought Gelmir, son of Gulin, Gwilin. Gwilin, that lord of Nargothrond whom they had captured in the Balgorok. Bragalak. Bragalak. Sorry, this one has more words than I thought. <laughs> and they had blinded him. Then the heralds of Angband showed him forth, crying, 
We have many more such at home, but you must make haste if you would find them, for we shall deal with them all when we return, even so. And they hewed off Galmir's hands and feet, and his head last, within sight of the elves, and left him. By ill chance at that place in the outwork stood Gwyndor of Nargothrond, the brother of Galmir. Now his wrath was kindled to madness, and he leapt forth on horseback, and many riders were with him, and many riders with him, and they pursued the heralds and slew them, and drove on deep into the main host. And seeing this all, the host of the Noldor was set on fire, and Fingon put on his white helm, and sounded his trumpets, and all the host of Hithlum leapt forth from the hills in sudden onslaught. The light of the drawing of the swords of the Noldor was like a fire in a field of reeds, and so fell and swift was their onset that almost the designs of Morgoth went astray. Before the army that he sent westward could be strengthened, it was swept away, and the banners of Fingon passed over Angband and were raised before the walls of Angband. Ever in the forefront of that battle went Gwyndor and the elves of Nargothrond, and even now they could not be restrained, and they burst through the gate and slew the guards upon the very stairs of Angband, and Morgoth trembled upon his deep throne, hearing them beat upon his doors. But they were trapped there, and all were slain, save Gwyndor only, whom they took alive, for Fingon could not come to their aid. By many secret doors in Thangorodrum, Morgoth had let issue forth his main host that he held in waiting, and Fingon was beaten back with great loss from the walls. Yeah, so the orcs managed uh, just by fate. It would it would happen that this guy's uh, this this poor soul's brother, um, Gelmir, his brother Gwyndor, is there and sees this all and just can't, you know, it just it breaks it breaks his will to hold back, and you know the rest there is is history so for they fall you know morgoth manages to foil the the plan of methros right to kind of hold back this force until all you know as much of the forces of angband are on the field and they can kind of hit them from the you know hit them from the side um and you know and it turns out morgoth has been holding back a significant force as well right so mm-hmm. and with that we uh the, the really the, the the big part of the battle is underway and um uh and and it actually uh does not go as badly as you would think right so even even for this even for this mistake um this uh error and discipline the the battle is actually still going pretty well for mm-hmm. you know for the forces of methros mm-hmm. for the union of yeah. methros right as well as could be expected yeah um but it's uh, the forces of Balerion almost win the day, but for the treachery of men. Yet neither by wolf, nor by Balrog, nor by dragon would Morgoth have achieved his end, but for the treachery of men. In this hour the plots of Ulfang were revealed. Many of the Easterlings turned and fled, their hearts being filled with lies and fear. But the sons of Ulfang went over suddenly to Morgoth and drove in upon the rear of the sons of Fanor. And in the confusion that they wrought, they came near to the standard of Methros. They reaped not the reward that Morgoth promised them, for Maglor slew Uldor the Accursed, the leader in treason, and the sons of Bor slew El- Ulfast and Ulwarth ere they, they themselves were slain. But new strength of evil men came up that, that Uldor had summoned and kept hidden in the eastern hills, and the host of Methros was assailed now on three sides, and it broke and was scattered, and fled this way and that. Yet fate saved the sons of Fanor, and though all were wounded, none were slain, for they drew together, and gathering a remnant of the Noldor and the Nalgrim about them, they hewed away out of the battle, and escaped far away towards Mount Dolmed in the east. So who is Ulfang? He's a he's a man, right? Yeah, this is one of those groups of men that came over, um, like kind of after the 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 three houses of the Edain, um, okay. and they were, you know, they they were Easterlings. Like there was one group of them that proved to be good men, and there was another group of them that proved to be kind of like treasonous and easily manipulated by Morgoth, right? Gotcha. And so yes. these were those okay. these were those men. Okay. Um, so we do learn that the dwarves, you know, did a pretty good job fighting on the side of the Union of Methros on this day, and they were they were remembered, you know, for that. Um, but you know, unfortunately, it's this it's this treachery of this particular group of men that uh, that really you know, ends, uh, causes the Ford, the union of Methros to lose the battle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, and perhaps the, the saddest moment, um, is the, uh, is the death of Fingon mm-hmm. at the hands of Gothmog, the Balrog. Yeah. 
But now in the western battle, Fingon and Turgon were assailed by a tide of foes thrice greater than all the force that was left to them. Gothmog, lord of Balrogs, high captain of Angband, was come. And he drove a dark wedge between the elven hosts surrounding King Fingon and thrusting Turgon and Hurin aside towards the Fen of Serik. Then he turned upon Fingon. That was a grim meeting. At last Fingon stood alone with his guard dead about him, and he fought with Gothmog until another Balrog came behind and cast a thong of fire about him. Then Gothmog hewed him with his black axe, and a white flame sprang up from the helm of Fingon as it was cloven. Thus fell the high king of the Noldor, and they beat him into the dust with their maces, and his banner, blue and silver, they trod into the mire of his blood. So, pretty brutal death. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, good for him for holding his own yeah, I was gonna against say, the Balrog. He, he died a he died a hero, that's for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um the field the field was lost. Um so uh with this we get we get this scene between uh Turgon, uh the king of Gondolin, and then Hurin and Hur, remember who are these two men who have actually been to Gondolin, right? Remember that from a couple of chapters ago that they had that uh, moment where they were they were rescued by the eagles on the field of battle, and then they were uh, they were brought to Gondolin, um, and lived there for a year with mm-hmm. Torgon. Mm-hmm. So we have this scene between the three of them and Torgon. You know, they they basically try to convince Torgon that he needs to retreat. He needs he needs to go back, save as much of the forces of Gondolin as he can, and preserve Gondolin. And of course, Torgon doesn't want to do that initially, but um, but Huor prevails upon him. And that's the that's our quote of the week, right? Uh, Torgon answered, "Not long now can Gondolin be hidden, and being discovered, it must fall." Then Huor spoke and said, "Yet if it stands but a little while, then out of your house shall come the hope of elves and men." This I say to you, Lord, with the eyes of death: though we part here forever, and I shall not look on your white walls again, from you and from me a new star shall arise. Farewell. And Megalin, Torgon's sister son, who stood by, heard these words and did not forget them, but he said nothing. Old Megalin. Mm. All right. Um, so, uh, so we we get this conversation. So Torgon's Torgon leaves with the forces of Gondolin. Hurin and Hur kind of uh, preserve a, a a small group that stays and kind of guards their rear as the forces of Gondolin retreat. Um, so they're able to you know hold hold them off just long enough for the forces of Gondolin to return via their secret passage. And uh, and not lead anybody back to uh, back to Gondolin, uh, any any forces of Morgoth back to back to Gondolin. I think that was that was good uh, advice. Yeah, who are in and who are his part. Yeah, well, who are unfortunately dies. He falls mm-hmm. pierced with a venomed arrow in his eye, and all the valiant men of Hador were slain about him in a heap. And the orcs hewed their heads and piled them as a mound of gold in the sunset. Um, and then last of all, it says, Hurin stood alone. Then he cast aside his shield and wielded an axe two-handed, and it, it is sung that the axe smoked in the black blood of the troll guard of Gothmog until it withered. And each time that he slew Hurin, that he, that he slew, Hurin cried, Aure in Tuluva, day shall come again. Seventy times he uttered that cry, but they took him at last alive by the command of Morgoth. For the orcs grappled him with their hands, which clung to him still, though he hewed off their arms. And even their numbers were renowned until at last he fell buried beneath them. Or I'm sorry, even their numbers were renewed until at last he fell buried beneath them. Then Gothmog bound him and dragged him to Angband with mockery. Thus ended near Nyath Arnoidiad, as the sun went down beyond the sea. Night fell in Hithlam, and there came a great storm of wind out of the west. So, Hurin is uh, is taken prisoner, uh, despite this just standing, you know, just slaying orcs just left uh, did you pick up on that image like so literally he's like hewing off the mm-hmm. arms of the orcs then their arms yeah. are just staying you know the the hands are just staying grabbing him and he's, he's just got like all these orc arms like grabbing onto him like just that he's just you know hewed off wow what an image it's like the head <laughs> of a snake right like you can cut you can separate it from its body but it's still yeah, well, like, well, yeah, but it, it's just a really cool mental image of like all these like arms of the orcs like hanging on to him, and he's still just like just, just like slaying them, going you know? at it. Yeah. Finally, if they have to take Gothmog, has to take matters into his own hands and drag him off. Um, so Hurin survives, and you know we'll we'll see what happens with him. Um, the next chapter of Turin Turinbar is another one of the great tales, and it concerns uh, his off the offspring of Hurin, right? And that's mm. where the the book 
the children of Hurin gets its name, um, which is, you know, a book we'll eventually do a, a chapter by chapter discussion of on the podcast. So, so the only one that really escapes is, is Torrent, is, uh, Torgon. Torgon. Right? Yeah. yeah. Huor dies. Yeah. Huron escapes and Torgon. Um, Wait, Huron is take, taken prisoner. I'm sorry. Huar escapes. No, who no, or dies. Yes. Huron is taken prisoner and right. Torgon, Torgon retreats. retreats to Gond- yeah. Gondolin. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So aftermath. So pretty, you know, pretty massive battle. Uh, you know, we understand now why it's called unnumbered tears. Many, yeah. many of these uh, members of the union of Methros lose their lives. And there's a lot of significant, I mean, this is basically kind of like, this is it, right? Like this is things, things go about as badly as they could have. And, uh, and it gets, it gets really ugly. You know, it's like the last time, you know, with Dagor Bragalak a couple of chapters ago, right? The battle of unsudden, of sudden flame. Um, that was pretty bad, but they were able to kind of hold, you know, hold the forces of Morgoth in the North. And this is like, okay, it's kind of like they're breaking out now. Yeah. Right. Um, so what's the aftermath? Well, first of all, Hithlum falls. Um, Hithlum is this is this region, um, you know, here to the northwest, and this was Fingon's, you know, Fingon's region over here, and so it's going to be overrun, and it's going to be given to, uh, well, it's it's where the it's where these treacherous men, the uh, the the people of Ulfong, end up going, and it's not really what they want. It's not really what they wanted, what they were promised by Morgoth, but it's what he gives them, and he kind of makes mm-hmm. them prisoners. Or he's like, "You're gonna go over there, and you're gonna like it." It's like that's not what you promised us, and it's like, "I'm Morgoth. Do you really think I was gonna keep my promise right? to you?" Like right? seriously. I know. So, uh, but anyway, they're not good. They're not good people. So they they go over to Hithlum, and they're you know, it's it's gonna be ugly for whoever the you know, uh, whoever the forces of Fingon were. Uh, or the left. people of Fingon and, and others living in that region, it's going to be ugly for them now. And it's basically just elderly, right? Yeah. Women and children, because yeah. everyone else would have been fighting. That's yeah. right. Uh, the sons of Feanor are scattered as leaves before the wind. So, you know, they, they've they lost their power and, um, you know, and, and just being, you know, they don't have any ability to, to wage this kind of war anymore, right? So they're stuck with their oath. <laughs> and um, And that's about all they got left at this point, right? That's about all they got left. This is feeling a little bit to me like the uh, end of Endgame. Like everything is just like... Oh, you mean uh, in, uh, Infinity what uh, Infinity War, right? Yeah, isn't it called... Wasn't the one called... Oh, yeah, Infinity in- Endgame War. Is the, was the one where everything... That's right. You're right, Infinity yeah. War. Yeah, yeah, the one just prior to Endgame. Yeah. Yes. Um, so Sons of Feanor scattered his leaves before the wind. A year later, the Havens are ruined by an assault from Morgoth. So the Havens being, uh, this kind of region over here, the Phallus. So this is Círdan's, um, you know, Círdan's region over here. He sails, he manages to, uh, escape with some of his ships and some of his people and sails down here way south to the, to the Isle of Balar, which you can't see right there. There you go. The Isle of Balar right there. Um, and... We do learn this little tidbit about Torgon requesting uh, a little bit of assistance from uh, Círdan, and we have this uh, scene of the seven swift ships. So, Greta, do you want to read this paragraph right here? And when Torgon heard of this, he sent again his messengers to Sirion's mouths and besought the aid of Círdan the shipwright. At the bidding of Turgon, Círdan built seven swift ships, and they sailed out into the west. But no tidings of them ever came back to Balar save of one, and the last. The mariners of that ship toiled long in the sea, and returning at last in despair, they foundered in a great storm within sight of the coasts of Middle-earth. But one of them was saved by Ulmo from the wrath of Ose, and the waves bore him up and cast him ashore in Nevrost. His name was Voronwe, and he was one of those that Torgon sent forth as messengers from Gondolin. Yeah, so... Is he going to come back into play? Um, I can't remember. I can't remember. It's um, weird that he'd be mentioned. But we have this, not. you know, that they send these seven swift ships, um, hoping to find some aid in the west. Um, but you know, of course, they're not able to reach. They're not able to get back to to Valinor that way, and so that does not work, unfortunately. No, unfortunately, not. Um, you know. So, but you know, Olmo does know about all of this, and so we, you know, one one would hope, I suppose, that Olmo would speak to his uh, Valar brethren and ask for their assistance for these people. Uh, but uh, anyway, we see that it's not an easy feat to sail into the West. No easy feat. 
And uh, and then we have a little bit more about Huron's fate. So, uh, you know, last we saw him, he was taken prisoner. And Morgoth, basically it says that Morgoth really hates Torgon. And he knows that Torgon and Huron were friends. And so he's determined to be really awful to Huron. This is what it says. Therefore, Huron was brought before Morgoth, for Morgoth knew that he had the friendship of the king of Gondolin. But Huron defied him and mocked him. Then Morgoth cursed Huron and Morwen and their offspring and set a doom upon them of darkness and sorrow. And taking Huron from prison, he set him in a chair of stone upon a high place of Thangorodrim. There he was bound by uh, the power of Morgoth, and Morgoth standing beside him cursed him again, and he said, Sit now there, and look out upon the lands where evil and despair shall come upon those whom thou lovest. Thou hast dared to mock me, and so question the power of Melkor, master of the fates of Arda. Therefore with my eyes thou shalt see, and with my ears thou shalt hear, and never shalt thou move from this place until all is fulfilled, until its bitter end. And even so it came to pass, but it is not said that Huron asked ever of Morgoth either mercy or death, before himself or for any of his kin. Um, yeah, so, you know, and we notice here, like, Melkor... I'm the master of the fates of Arda. He just wants he just wants to be in control, yeah. right? Yep. That's a pretty <laughs> terrible punishment. Yeah. I mean to basically have have uh have Melkor's eyes and ears. I yeah. mean, gosh, what a dark existence. Yeah, well, in that interesting like, you know, it's kind of like the, I guess the idea there is like you hear if you hear with his eyes and ears, it's going to be you know, you 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 ever you know, the saying of like seeing through somebody else's eyes, like, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, I finally, I finally saw it from somebody else's perspective, you know, this other person's perspective and it like changes kind of how you see things, right. Yeah. How you perceive the world. And, and that's that kind of the idea here, but it's like a really negative thing, right? It's like, if you could see like through the most like cynical, hateful eyes possible, mm-hmm. right. Um, just like, just wants to twist everything to its worst yeah. possible way of viewing it. You know, now you've got to see it that way. Now you've got to hear it that way, right? Just everything is suspicion. Mm-hmm. Everything is about power. You know, just a really, really ugly way of, of viewing the world. Yep. So. Yep. Yeah, especially given someone who is, you know, so valiant and um, heroic, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just, ugh, it's terrible. Yeah. Well, um, Last note of this chapter is the Houth in Houth in Nirnaith, right? Which is this um, hill of tears, um, and it's this big mound of the dead from the battle that they pile up. And it says, uh, by the by, the command of Morgoth, the orcs with great labor gathered all the bodies of those who had fallen in the great battle and all their harness and weapons and piled them in a great mound in the midst of Anfaglith. And it was like a hill that could be seen from afar. Houth in Nindingen, the elves named it the hill of slain, and howled in their nighth, the hill of tears. But grass came there and grew again, long and green, upon that hill, alone in all the desert that Morgoth made. And no creature of Morgoth trod thereafter upon the earth, beneath which the swords of the Eldar and the Edain crumbled into rust. Um, so in this little, you know, big wasteland, you know, the Unfaugleth, right? Um, we have this just hill of the bodies and in their green green mm-hmm. it's the one spot of of green of growth uh that grass came to it again mm-hmm. so so again there's just like a little a little uh, ray of hope yeah you know just a little a little piece of um of green in the midst of this desert yes maybe yeah little 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 just thought that maybe some good will come mm-hmm. right that that mm-hmm. no matter what happens can the good ever be you know be quenched right right, right. yeah yeah. So, any final thoughts on this chapter, Greta? I don't think so. All right. Yeah, All right. That's good. All right. Well, let's do some haiku. Let's do it. All right. Rock, paper, paper scissors, scissors, shoot. shoot. Boom. Who is going first? Um, you go first. I go first. Here we go. <clears throat> Due to deceit, great was Morgoth's victory. Yet they shall come again. Nice. Yeah. I feel like I want to memorize. I need to remember that. I, like, uh, just like, what, what does he say? He says. Um, oh, in Elvish? Yeah. Yeah. Aure untuluva. I want to remember that. Day shall come again. 
That's what I say. Last thing I say every night before I go to sleep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Aure in Tuluva. <laughs> like just like, you're, like falling asleep. Like, Aure in Tuluva. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ray into that, that's, oh, that's that, a great battle cry. I know. You know? Really I know. I love it. I, I truly, I'm serious. I, yeah, I, I, I feel like I want to remember that. Yeah. Just I'll I'll... ray into Luva. Mm-hmm. It's good. Just remember that one whenever things feel dark for you. That's a good mm-hmm. one to remember. Mm-hmm. Days shall come again. Days shall come again. It's like a more poetic way of saying this too shall pass, right? Yeah. Like, because I like that it says day. Like well, I feel like it's light. mightier than than this too shall pass. Well, right? right. That's what did I say? I meant like. So you said it's another way of saying. Oh, uh, I'm saying. Well, it's I like meant a, to say a greater. It's a greater oh, okay. way of saying it. Yeah, then we agree. Yeah, Might, yeah, mightier. I just meant like it's like instead of like, this too shall pass. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it's like day shall come again. Yeah. Right? You know? Yeah. Yep. All right, ready for my haiku? Let's do it. The day has arrived. Hearts lifted high. Victory nigh. False friends fly the field. Ooh, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice. And we have one from Don J. You want to read this one, Greta? Sure. Ending is the night. New King Torgon, Morgoth feared. They shall come again. Yes. Ah, we had the same last lines. Well, that day shall come again nice. is very, very memorable. Yeah, you know? it is. It's good. Aure in Tuluva. Aure in Tuluva. Oh, nice rolled R. Are. Do the elves roll their R? I think so. Are I I think the uh you know it may vary a little bit, but yeah. Are in Tuluva. Are in Tuluva. Yes. All right. Um. Yes. Us in, us native English speakers. You know, whenever we learn to roll the R's, we like want to do it all the time because 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 we don't have that normally in our language. Right. It's you know, true. and then like it's true. And then you hear like people speaking Spanish and they just like roll the R like it ain't no thing, and you're just like I'm kind of jealous. Yeah, it sounds cool. Your language sounds cooler than mine. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, hey, once your haiku read on a future episode, each episode will be uh will be reading those haiku that are sent to us. So, go ahead and get them in AS- ASAP. All right. Hey, everybody. Subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes or the platform of your choice. If you're a five-star fan of the Tolkien Road, you can really help us out by heading over to iTunes, your preferred source for the show, and dropping us a rating and review. When you do that, it helps get the word out about the Tolkien Road, which helps us to keep on evering on. All right. And hey, drop us a line. Always love that correspondence. Uh, we're going we're, we're gonna to catch up on some correspondence for too long. It's been a little while, uh, a little behind, been been behind on, uh, on the correspondence lately, but um, you know, we're nearing the end of we're not too far off from our, the end of our Silmarillion, Silmarillion reread. And, I know, that's crazy. You know, I'm thinking we're yeah. going to, you know, do some uh, do some deep dives on some correspondence, some really good correspondence. So, oh, yeah. that would be fun. At some point, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, well, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks you to our amazing patrons, especially the following. John R. Caitlin of Tea with Tolkien. Jacob Lockham. John H. Scotchy Bobo. Ms. Anonymous. Andrew T. Red Hawk. Shannon S. Brian O. Emilio P. Zeke F. James A. James L. Chris L. Chuck F. Ozzy V. Ish of the Hammer. Teresa C. David of Pints with Jack. Jonathan D. Eric B. Johanna T. Mike M. Robert H. Paul D. Julia. Warty. Matthew W. Joe Bagelman. Chris K. Jacob S. Don J. Thanks, guys. As well as those celebrating their patron anniversary in July of 2022, Warty. Matthew W. Vite N. David of Pints with Jack. And Chris L. Awesome. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Mm-hmm. Appreciate you patrons so much. And thanks, everybody, for listening. We will talk at you next And watching. Yes. Wherever you are, listening or watching. We'll talk at you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye.